Everyone, welcome back to Pine Hollow Auto Diagnostics. Behind me, I have a 1995 Mercedes wagon that was towed here from Connecticut about nine hours away. Very cool looking car. I've never actually worked on a Mercedes wagon before. It is the E320 model. It's got the 3.2 liter inline six. A uh, customer complaint is, well, he wrote me a little story, but he said he, he was actually driving it for quite a while, and then it just started acting up, kind of stumbling, misfiring, and then it just completely quit. And they threw some parts at it. Um, I'll look in the notes. But when it got here, the battery was deader than a doornail, about one volt, or two volts. <clears throat> let's see what we're at right now oh, it says bat <laughs> I guess it didn't like the uh, the battery there or something but let's check the voltage anyways yeah 4.5 yeah that's not gonna work so vintage iron here from Germany and you know just do a quick little visual inspection hey we got some acorns here so we could be looking at some rodent damage and then I uh, also found a little problem back here uh oh you know that might definitely cause a crank no start especially on these vintage uh, Mercedes I've seen that problem before but let's uh, let's not guess let's get out some equipment and get to the diagnosis so the charger goes does go all the way up to 14 volts but as soon as you take the charger off our voltage drops to nothing so this Napa Legend battery is deader than a doornail it's only a year old but that's not gonna work so we need a good battery here for testing because crank no sorry obviously you got to crank it to do some checks all right back from Napa we got a brand new legend battery 7548 and uh, I didn't know that you couldn't just bring in any Napa battery to any store you have to be the original purchaser at that store or have a receipt so this guy's gonna have to take his you know junk battery back to his store back in Connecticut so he's gonna have to pay me full price for this you know and the core included so that's how it goes so amp clamp is on the negative cable it's zeroed out let's connect it <laughs> we see we have a 0.6 amp draw let's uh, zero that again Point 0.1 amps so it looks like there is a parasitic draw let's just see what it does make sure we have some oil in the crankcase and it looks like there's there is oil that's all I really care about let's see if this thing fires up or at least cranks All right. Okay, crank no start. Good deal. Now we need to look up some service info. And with this old thing, I don't think I want to bother with a scanner just yet. I just want to hook up a scope and see if we have injector pulse, if we have uh, spark just the basics these engines they don't really lose compression even at 286,000 miles that's uh, barely broken in <laughs> so I think we'll get up the scope and just uh, go from there so parasitic draw check about 16 to 17 milliamps I would say that's normal especially for a fancy European with a uh, you know this thing has more electronics for 95 than most other cars so that's actually very reasonable but the fact that it was sitting for you know, at least half a year 
That's why the battery is stone cold dead. So, if you have a car with modules and you're leaving it for more than, let's say, a couple of weeks, just disconnect the battery and it'll save you hundreds of dollars, literally. So now, we can get to the fun part of uh, seeing why this car does not run. So here's the fuel rail. I assume there's some way to connect a fuel pressure gauge. And then fuel injectors are right here. Pretty easy to, to back probe. We can do uh, put a scope on there and the ignition coils. It looks like they already have this cover kind of coming up. There's the coil. And it looks like each coil sparks you know, at least two cylinders. Yeah, it must be a waste spark system, so three coils and six cylinders. So we'll get on the control wire for that. And then look up a wiring diagram, see what this thing has. Crank, cam sensors, see what we're missing. This is probably a cam sensor right here. The engine computer lives right here. All right, so back to the Mercedes. Uh, I did some research last night on how to read these uh, trouble codes, flash codes. Uh, so two options, you either have to have a, a handheld tester, Mercedes specific tool, or you can just use a simple uh, LED, but you have to know how to trigger each module to flash the codes. So again, a couple hours, hours of research, I actually found some documents online. Uh, for example, this one right here, very helpful. W124 diagnostic trouble codes, uh, models with the M104 engine. So, these modules, you can they can flash codes. There's a diagnostic module, maybe present only in models with California emissions. We'll uh, get to that in a little bit. Airbag, automatic climate control, this is the one we're interested in. HFM SFI, it's hot film, <laughs> hot film engine management. <laughs> That's what Mercedes calls it. The roll bar for the uh, convertible, and then this electronic accelerator with ASR traction control. So we need to figure out if we're California and if we have ASR. And basically, you look at where the throttle body is. So there is a cable there. Very fancy linkage. Uh, and then right here it says conforms to EPA regulations, also conforms to California regulations. So if it's California, in this diagnostic connector, it's going to have a little push button and an LED in spots two and four. That's how you tell. And then if it has ASR, that's uh, anti-slip traction control. Uh, when you turn the key on, you'll see this orange triangle light up here. And you can see our check engine light does light up. So let's, let's crank it for a little bit, see what happens. Okay, so now, if there are any problems, the computer should store, you know, if the signal's missing completely, should store something. Now, which module do we scan first? Well, the, um, this diagnostic module on the California Emissions cars actually talks to the engine control module and the ABS control module or traction control through a uh, high speed CAN, you know, two wire network. This is our diagnostic module right here. And you can see this wire from pin six goes to our little switch with the LED. So let's use that to our advantage before going any deeper. And the diagnostic module, it's kind of like going into OBD2 generic mode versus the OEM Mercedes side. It'll give you more basic codes, but we should check that first and that, that's very easy to do. It actually printed out the descriptions of all the codes from this diagnostic module. They're just up to two digit codes. 
and we'll get a one if no malfunctions in system monitor. And then if there's if there are any problems, we'll get the corresponding code. And how do you read that? Well, there's a a cool video here. Read it and clear check engine lights 88 to 95 Mercedes from uh, this channel, Rick's Mercedes OBD1 Diagnostic Code Reader. So this guy basically made a little LED box that you can plug into uh, <laughs> and check the other modules, not just the diagnostic module, but what we're going to do is just use a little 12 volt LED as a built in resistor in there with some banana jacks and uh, if we need to go past the diagnostic module we can go straight to the engine control module which is on pin 8 you'll see right there there's the actual pin out so 1, t 1 through 16 and we have the California model with the LED so those are the descriptions of each pin And it's interesting to see that uh, pin 10 is TN signal. That's like the tachometer signal, which we can see on our engine control diagram. I also want to put a scope on that. Right there, pin 10, green, yellow. You can see it goes to AC compressor. It goes to our instrument cluster for the tach. It goes to our ABS. Basically anything that needs to know how fast the engine's turning and the engine control module puts that out on pin 18. This is the entire engine control module. I said tack out. So we can probe it right at the diagnostic connector, which is very, uh, very cool. So let's try to scan this diagnostic module for codes. So with the key on, if you press the button, the LED should light up. That means on our diagram, the, this LED has power and the button is just grounding it out. Now if you ground it out for three seconds, 1001, 1002, 1003, let it go, this thing should, should flash something. And it's not flashing anything whatsoever. It should at least flash a one if no malfunctions are indicated. Let's try again. So that's a problem, that's not how this system is supposed to work. <laughs> Again, that could either lead us in the right direction or the wrong direction. Uh, let's see what voltage is on pin 3. If this diagnostic module is alive at all, we don't really need it. It's more of an emissions thing. But then we can go for pin 8, that's the engine control module. And since we don't have a built-in pulser for pin 8, we'll use our little LED. So first I want to check the basics here. Let's see if pin 16, circuit 15, that should be a power. Indeed, test light is lit. And let's see if pin 1 is a ground so from battery positive now. That's a good ground. Okay, so we have good ground and power here. So we can do our checks with the little LED pulser tool. Now this tool, we want to set up just the same way as this pulser. So let's try it on pin three first. So we want power going to our LED first. If it finds a ground, the LED should light up. Let's see here. Yes, the LED will light up. So if we go from pin 16 to one, LED lights up. That's a good test. And it's a one-way circuit, so keep in mind the positive and the negative do matter on a diode. So now, let's plug in the LED to pin 3. You can see it's not lit. If we push the button, yes, it lights up. But the module is not responding. The diagnostic module is not blinking the LED. Very, very interesting. Could that have anything to do with 
the problem. Well, it's not working as it should, so perhaps. Let's move the pulser to pin 8 now. And now we have to manually ground out, move this to ground, so if it finds a power, test light will light up. So we need to manually ground the LED for three seconds to get some codes. One, two, three. Let's see if we start flashing. One, two, three, four. And then for each code, you have to do the same procedure. So let's ground it out again. So that's code four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 21, 22, 23, 24. So 4 and 24, let's write those down. So this is pin 8, number 4, number 24. Let's see if there's any more. 1, 2, 3. Man, what a pain in the ass way to get codes. So we have three codes already, that's useful. Let's see if there's any more. One, two, three, four. Okay, now it's going back. So we have three codes stored. How about that? Now this is a 1995 fancy Mercedes, and the best they can do is give you codes with flashes. Compare that to a GM. Even in the 80s, you can hook up a scanner and read codes and live data. So I would say American cars are were actually more advanced in terms of um, being friendly for mechanics to diagnose than than these things. Let's look up these codes and see what they say. All right, here we go. So here's the full code list on this document here. You can also go to all data, but this is a very nice summary. So first code, if you're using the pulser tool, you're gonna get a four, four flashes. Now if you had the uh, handheld tester from Mercedes, you can see these two codes are both four, but this one say hot, Film math sensor airflow and possibility high or hot film math sensor open circuit. Hey, that would definitely cause the engine not to start. <laughs> so let's write that down. So four is math circuit. Okay, let's look up 24. CKP sensor, magnet, so 24 can be these, any of these three codes, RPM impossibly high, magnet is missing, segment control, number of teeth impossible, or signal not recognized slash impossible. CKP sensor. Now the guy said he replaced the sensor with something that he thought would work. <laughs> he said it was for one model year newer, but We'll definitely need to scope the CKP pattern. Unrecognizable. Very interesting. So signal not recognized or implausible, that would definitely cause the car not to start. And let's look up 47, the last one. Uh, I'm not seeing 47 here. Hmm. 
Did they skip it over? 45, 46, 48, 49, 50. We can go to all data just to make sure. Let me hit connect to the internet. All right, so on all data under diagnostic trouble codes, you can see we have diagnostic module codes, which we couldn't read at all, and then sequential multiport fuel injection and ignition codes. Um, this is with impulse counter scan tool. Let's see if 47 even exists. <clears throat> no, it does not. And we have code 47. <laughs> I double checked it just now. Well, I guess uh, we won't care about 47 for now, but we're definitely concerned about was it 24 CKP sensor that's a big um, big problem uh, what we could do since these could be history codes we have them written down we can actually reset each code so the math the CKP sensor and 47 and then uh, crank it again see if they come back right away so the way to reset the codes is first you need to read the code. There's our LED. Again, we're just grounding the diagnostic pin for three seconds. Let's see, 1001, 1002, 1003. It'll flash one, two, three, four. Now we need to ground this for eight seconds. 1001. 1002, 1003, 1004, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now that code should be erased. Now let's move on to the next code. So 1, 2, 3. And it should flash code 24. There was code 24. Now we'll hold it for 8 seconds again. 1, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that code should be cleared. And now let's read the code 47. I'll let it blink through and we'll clear that one. And then it should be, once all, all the codes are cleared, it should just blink once and have uh, no malfunctions detected. Okay, so it stopped blinking code 47. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so that code should be cleared. Now let's read the codes one more time. One, two, three. Perfect, it actually worked, unbelievable. <laughs> now, let's shut the key off. Give it a few seconds here. All right. You might ask, why not just get the scope out and do the basic checks? Well, we could, but this is really cool. <laughs> and then the car actually can give you a really good clue. Instead of checking all the sensors, we can just check, you know, MAF and CKP or I guess the crankshaft position sensor is the most important one for starting. The, you know, mass airflow kicks in once the engine gets going, so it could be a start stall, but this one is not coughing at all. So let's uh, turn it on and crank it. Okay. Let's see if any codes set right away. So our diagnostic module, let's uh, let's see, one, two, three. And it looks like that's just dead in the water, so we can only talk to the engine controller, which is fine. So one, two, three. Two, 
24. Woohoo! Just a CKP sensor. Man, this, this thing's pretty smart. Let's do one more time just to make sure that's the only code. Beautiful. So that was definitely worth doing. Clearing all the codes and now we just have crankshaft position sensor signal. Amazing. I love it. That gives us excellent direction. So now, looking at our engine diagram, where does this thing live? And how do we check it? Obviously with a scope. Let's see here. So engine diagram here. Camshaft position sensor, crankshaft position sensor. It looks like there's just a shield. It's it's one wire, so two wires. Pins 29 and 30, no color available, probably black, and green at the engine control module. Camshaft position sensor, pins 8 and 19. We should check the signal of those. They're both, they look like two wires, just variable reluctance, you know, sine wave signals. And then, we can obviously check the outputs. Pretty easy to get to the injectors, control wires, and probably the spark. So let's find the easiest way to check check these sensors. We probably have to go to the engine control module. All right, so here's our engine controller right back here with these two plugs. And this is uh, apparently another computer. And actually they're pretty easily movable so we can kind of move this out of the way. So there is part number on that one and we can unplug these connectors and one of them is going to be the right one <laughs> but we need to take off these caps so we can actually find the right wires to probe because getting to the CKP sensor I looked it's buried near the bell housing on this side and even if we can get to the sensor the connector is going to look like this you can't really back probe it because it's a shielded wire. It comes in here and you can see it's a almost like a BNC cable. So easiest place to do this is at the computer even though we have to take those connectors apart. So let me try to do that. Alright, these connectors are not very back probe friendly. You have to remove the screw and just kind of pry it out but the wires aren't long enough so this is all like shrink wrap so I don't want to destroy the harness here but I carefully poked a couple holes so channel 1 is the CKP signal wire that's this green one at the computer at pin 30 channel 2 is on the camshaft position sensor that's the pink wire pin 8 right there and then channel 3 the green I just put on an injector now, <laughs> both of the colors on the injector are the same, but if we're in the power wire, we'll at least see a little voltage drop if the injectors fire. I assume they don't fire because the car is, uh, you know, disabled. So I'm going to try to plug this back in best I can here. See if this works, and then we'll crank it and then uh, see what happens on the scope. All right, so the connector is, I think all the pins are seated, so good enough. Let's crank it over and see if our scope shows anything at all. So wait for the screen to clear. Key on. Injector voltage is up and crank. And shut it off. Okay. Here's what we see. We see injector pulse. That's cool. Let's take a look, uh, save this and take a close look at that crank sensor. All right, this is super cool. Check this out. 
So the cam sensor, there's one pulse per, I guess, per revolution of the cam. And then on the crank, we have one huge pulse, two, three, four, five, six. So six up, and then looks like six down. One, two, three, four, five, six down. And I'm not sure if this is correct. It could be. Like, is that a sink notch? But, I mean, it looks like a, a crank signal, you know? Except for the sink notch, I don't know if that is appropriate or not. We ha we'll have to take a look at service info to see what, what this should look like. I mean, the fact that it goes down and up here, but here we only have up and then down, and up and then down, and this is like, ba-boom. Is that correct? I, I don't think so. I, I would assume it would just be like all these other pulses. And the injectors are firing. I'm curious to put an, uh, a probe on an ignition coil, see if we have spark. But apparently the computer is fussing about about this. It doesn't like the actual signal. The signal is there, but man, that that's some weird stuff there. So I got this waveform saved. If we can find a known good waveform, that would be great. Now the owner, he has his daily drivers another one of these, I think with the same engine. So I don't know if he has a scope or not, but that would be really neat to see a known good crank pattern off of, you know, off of this engine. Let's uh, hook up channel 4 to an ignition coil just to see what we have. Okay, very, very interesting. So looking up information on this crankshaft position sensor function, Look at this. There are actual little permanent magnets installed on the segments on the flywheel. So the scope pattern, this is amazing. Mercedes apparently provides a scope pattern. Now this is, keep in mind this is cylinder one, three, four, two, one. And here they have permanent magnets on cylinder three and cylinder two. So you do have these big spikes, just like we saw in our waveform. However, do we have enough spikes? Because we only have one spike for the entire revolution of the crankshaft. So this is one camshaft revolution. We can even uh, put some cursors in here. So that's 720. So we have one spike there between 0 and 180, one spike between 360 and 540. Is that proper? So we just have one permanent magnet on the entire flywheel while in the service info for a four cylinder engine, they have two permanent magnets on the entire flywheel. Is that correct? Uh, maybe we can get a picture of a flywheel and see how many permanent magnets are supposed to be on there. Is it one? Is it two? <laughs> Is it three? Hmm. I mean the computer's fussing about the signal. Uh, I still want to connect a probe to the ignition coil control wire to see if if there is a spark. Um, if that's hard to do, we can put a paddle probe on the ignition coil just to see, you know, if spark is occurring. But, uh, yeah, this is very interesting. Okay, so I found a pattern for this particular engine. It's in the, uh, the main kind of engine control module diagnostic procedure. And 
right here, model 124, it says crankshaft position sensor L5 signal. Arrow equals magnet for control of ignition coil T11 for cylinder number 1 and 6. So it's there, just one magnet for one crankshaft revolution. This looks very similar to what we have on the scope. So that pattern right there. So why is this computer fussing about the crank signal? So it occurs on one of the falling spikes. So it's low, high, low, high, low, or high, low, high, low, high, and then the big spike, and then high, low, high, low again. Is that what our service info looks like? So this super high spike is in, in between two high spikes on a low spike. And it looks, I guess, inverted, but it depends on how you have your scope connected. It doesn't look wrong, so I'm assuming this is one segment. You see these are kind of closer together. And this one's closer together. Magnet's there, there's just one magnet. So now we need to check if there is indeed ignition control. Alright, so I added the fourth channel to cylinder one ignition control wire. And that would be, here's ignition coil one. The control wire goes to pin nine right next to the uh, camshaft position sensor. So I'm just using a little needle and it's stuffed in there. So it's definitely connected. Let's, uh, Let's crank this over and see if we have any sort of ignition waveform. Huh. The signal should have gone up to 12. It did not. So are we missing a power to our ignition coils? Let me just disconnect it real quick. Definitely at zero volts on that yellow wire. That's not supposed to happen. This is supposed to be at 12 volts until the computer pulses the ignition coil. Hmm. Well, just a, it was just a poor connection of the back probe. That's why back probes are sometimes not the most reliable connection to make when you're doing a scope measurement. So let's uh, let's crank it over. Ooh, did it almost fire? It's a waste spark system, so it should spark. I mean, that <laughs> does not look like a good waveform for an ignition coil at all. Definitely no spark occurring, but what the heck is this? So weird. Oh, it kind of sounded like it sneezed. Hmm. All right, let's let's try this again. Key off, key on. There's definitely no ignition. All right, so I got spark plug number two out. 
it is wet with gas. We indeed we have no spark. And actually these connectors you can take off the cap. I'm probing the control wire now. And that was the coil we were looking at before. So black and red on pin 9, it's actually ignition coil 1, but it controls spark plugs number 2 and 5. And those are the companions. So 1 and 6, 2 and 5, 3 and 4. <clears throat> so I don't think there's a way to really mess these up in terms of plugging them in. Brand new coils, brand new plugs, Bosch, everything's good. So... Right now what I want to do is just unplug the cam sensor and see if the strategy of the computer, if we can at least fire this engine without the cam sensor. So this is what it looks like sometimes. You get some kind of weird stuff on the control wire. It's not dropping all the way down and firing like you would expect it to. But then other times you crank it and there is absolutely nothing. Let's see here. Like, you know, that crank right there, it started doing something all the way through, and then on these cranks it doesn't. So go figure. Let's just see what happens without the cam sensor plugged in. So it still fires the injectors, but not, not the spark. It's the weirdest thing. 